if you put your finger down on a piece of sellotape and then you shine even your mobile phone torch across it, you'll see all of that ridge detail that's picked out from your fingertips. Pangolins are small, scaly animals found in Africa and Asia. They're also the most trafficked mammal in the world. Each year, an estimated 2.7 million of them are poached and traded for their meat, but also for their scales that are used in traditional medicine. I've come to Portsmouth to meet a team of forensic scientists who are collaborating with wildlife crime investigators to use techniques that are usually found on crime scenes in the fight against organised wildlife trafficking. Brian Chappell was one of the initial catalysts in bringing this collaboration together at the University of Portsmouth. There was a seizure of pangolin scales in Singapore last year, 14 tonnes. And obviously the demand for pangolin still exists. As you may be aware, certainly in terms of traditional medicine uh, in Southeast Asia, also is a luxury meat in, in some countries in Southeast Asia, as well as bush meat in Africa. This was a conversation about the risk to rangers, starting off in Africa, who were exposed and were at risk to their lives actually, through poachers who are using semi-automatic, military-grade weaponry to conduct their business. And the issue was actually on the risk and the time they were spending in the field to use conventional fingerprinting and other crime scene techniques to retrieve that trace evidence to try and investigate those offences. The project initially looked at how to apply forensic techniques to assist rangers working with traffic commodities such as rhino horn and ivory. Jack Reed, a senior lecturer in forensic science, realised that it could also be used to collect fingerprints and trace evidence from pangolin scales, a trade that has increased dramatically in recent years. So, lab coat? Yeah, if you could pop the lab coat on for me, that'd be fabulous. OK. Also have a visor for you to wear here today. OK. Brilliant. Come with me. OK. So, Jack, how did it all come about? Myself and a colleague, Paul Smith, we were at ZSL one day, and they had a stuffed pangolin there. And literally, they brought it out, put it on the table. I looked at Paul, he looked at me, and we both said at the same time, we could get a fingerprint from that using the gel. And that's how, as practitioners, that was our contribution to that element of it. We knew that because we'd worked in that field, what kind of surfaces you could get finger marks from. As a crime scene investigator, you would go to a number of crime scenes and you could collect traces from um, murders, burglaries, all sorts of things. There's all kinds of things that you can collect from um, the gel, specifically. Um, so we've been using it in the UK and uh, in Western crime scene investigation for a very long time. So what about this whole setup and process makes it innovative? I think uh, it's one word, it's context. I think what we've done is repurposed and established technology for use in a different environment. If you can imagine that um, if I go to a, a crime scene and it's a house, when I get there, there will be uh, perhaps police personnel all the way around the house. I will have a cordon set up. Before I go in, I'm donning my white suit, putting my gloves on, so all my PPE. And then once I'm in, I'm starting to think about perhaps how I'm going to recover that evidence, how I'm going to record that evidence. Now, if you go directly into somewhere like the Savannah, and you've got a ranger who's out in their truck and they might come across, for example, an elephant carcass or several elephant carcasses. The first thing that they're going to think of is not how can I protect my scene, how quickly can I get in and out of this scene because there may be poachers still in the area, you know, and that puts them at great peril. So they need to be in and out of the scene very quickly. Traditional fingerprinting kits that use powder, brushes and tape were potentially too cumbersome and time-consuming to be used in the field. This is the kit. This was... The packs created here contain 10 gelatine lifters, scissors, insulating packs, evidence bags, a roller and a simple pictorial guide. It tells you systematically what to do. The gel lifters are a quick and easy way to lift fingerprints. So it's a black-backed, low-tack adhesive. 
once you take a plastic cover off of it, you can then press onto any surface that's dry or even if it's dusty. And that will then lift particles, ridge detail, pollen, mycology, soil, all sorts of things. Can we take a look? Yeah, let's do that. So, here we have a pangolin scale. It's quite thin, isn't it? Yeah, can I? Yeah, absolutely, if you like to grip it. And that's exactly the way that the pangolin is descaled. And so if you're pulling it, there's a good chance that you've left your fingerprint on there. So you're saying my finger and thumbprint is on this now? Should be. So how do you recover those prints? So if I take that off you, what you can do then is create a sandwich of the gel. Just peel that top cover off there, place pangolin over the top there, but you've gripped it, haven't you, between your finger and thumb. Yeah. So let's try and capture the top as well. So what we're going to do is sandwich this between two pieces of gel, like so. Well, let's see if we can uh, get a fingerprint from this one. So I'm going to put them both in together, side by side. There we go, pop that on there. The scanner has got a vacuum in it, which will draw down the gel so it's flat to the plate. So what exactly is happening in this box right now? So it's multispectral light that's being absorbed and then refracted. So it's hitting the gel at different angles. And you can do this at home if you just put your finger down on a piece of sellotape and then you shine even your mobile phone torch across it, you'll see all of that ridge detail that's picked out from your fingertips. Much of the same way and it absorbs that light. And then the image is reproduced over here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, you can definitely make out that it's a pangolin. You can, there's the pangolin, there's that little ridge that's uh, at the top of that. And you could see on here all of those nice ridges and undulations. Now I can see a little bit of ridge detail just here, but I suspect uh, that you're not a very good depositor. Oh, that doesn't sound very good. Well, it doesn't. If you're out in environments like the jungle or the forest or you're poaching, you're going to have a lot more constituents. You're going to be a bit sweaty, uh, certainly on your hands. But if you're a person who has dry hands, have you been sanitising? Yes. Washing your hands regularly? Yes. Yeah, like us all. So we're going to be quite poor depositors. So can you show me what a sample would look like where you can clearly see the fingerprint. Yeah, sure. That is a fingerprint. Ah, uh, yeah. But that, if I found that at a crime scene, I'd be jumping for joy. Because really? often we only get partials at a crime scene, but that is like almost like a perfect, perfect thumbprint. Of course, the poachers in the field are often at the bottom level of these criminal trafficking networks and are often motivated by poverty or coercion. But any information gained from identifying them can assist in disrupting networks or identifying those in control of this illegal and unsustainable trade. Prevention through education or redirection is another strategy that can help individuals and even communities who may be involved in poaching. A great example has been the Highland Gorillas of the Bawindi Impenetrable Forest National Park in Africa, where those who were once involved in poaching or killing gorillas because of farm incursions now protect them because of ecotourism. In terms of going forward, we're very much at an early stage, but we feel as if we can contribute, working collaboratively with our partners. And part of the project has been collaboration and building our stakeholder partnerships. Through partners ZSL and the Wildlife Conservation Society, they've collaborated with wildlife crime enforcement and anti-trafficking personnel in Cameroon, Kenya, Benin and India. The technique has also been formally recognised and promoted for use by the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species and Interpol. It's seen as an important addition to any wildlife crime investigator's toolkit. Certainly the use of any forensic technique as part of a wildlife crime investigator's toolkit is got to be a good thing. It's raising the awareness of the technique, it's low cost, um, certainly its utility uh, within the particular operating environment is quite considerable actually. On a wider point, I think there's a more of a general effort in terms of 
investigation into wildlife crime and organised crime networks who are responsible for the poaching is how we apply those techniques we take for granted in terms of investigating organised crime here. Pangolins remain on the critically endangered list, and if trends continue, they could become extinct within 10 years, making initiatives like this even more vital in the fight against wildlife traffickers. That's it for another amazing episode of Razor. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications.